we have we have been working together for years filming and this is the first time you have seen me with makeup <laughs> yes and i also have makeup on yes and you have hair yes lots of hair and I, I was disappointed to find that this is augmented i thought this mm. was I, i looked in the mirror i said wow i have lots of hair yung pala there's something in it so they put like a like a like mixing bowl <laughs> yes they put they put a bowl in it to get that kind of height so i know what it is it's styrofoam no i think it's fake hair or, uh, more hair, or cat hair <laughs> they, they collected the cat hair from my house Jokno is a filmmaker who recently spent three days naked in a Japanese town. What were you doing naked in a Japanese town? So, just, just being myself. Uh, As in naked, naked. No, no man, not not necessarily naked. Sorry, sorry, it just Aww. destroyed the image that you set up for people. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay when because when people are watching this, they will just imagine you naked. So. Ew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, okay. What so were you doing? Uh, I, we were I was on vacation with my partner Roy. We went around that central area of Japan, and we found ourselves in an onsen town called Kinosaki, mm-hmm. which is excellent. It's two hours from Kyoto. You check into a ryokan, uh, this traditional kind the of hotel, house, yes. and then they give you um, a what do you call this? A robe, mm-hmm. a yukata. They give you geta, which are these wooden clogs, and you basically take off your clothes, put on the robe, and walk around t- town like that. And then you get a pass, so you can hop from one. Basically, from one hot bath to the next. To the next, yes, basically. And are these, as in, anyone can use them, or are they segregated? Men, women, children, <laughs> what? What or... are you trying to say? <laughs> no, I see. No, I see. Um, are there like men, women, <laughs> children? <laughs> children. <laughs> no, basically. Cats. Yeah. <laughs> No men and women. Although we're not gonna get into that discussion because that yes. that's the big issue. Yes. But yeah, you know, men and women. So so I think they were for general use. Yeah, the, yeah for the, general. The I mean, baths? it's nothing. I mean, a public bath mm-hmm. is to them just so normal. It's like eating a meal with your family. Like you're there. Like you would see Wait, generations. Do they actually eat meals while in the bath? No. Okay. But but you can get you can buy outside. An egg that was cooked inside the onsen with people with, uh, in it with the sweat, <laughs> uh, the ball sweat. Okay. No, I... but yeah, it's normal to see like generations of Japanese men there. Like, see the grandfather, the father. So basically, you saw a lot of naked people in your three days in that town. Saw a lot of penises, yes. So now you you can, you've seen the entire range. And so, do you notice a correlation between <laughs> physical appearance and how it looks? No correlation between physical appearance and looks. Okay. But the thing is, I think as a Filipino coming in to an onsen, you have to be really just present of the fact that you should keep your eyes up there. It's like being on the New York subway, na no eye contact. Yeah, uh, yeah. But no, I think it's really good. It, you just, it's like a social glue, I mm-hmm. think, to them. In one setting, they are all on equal. Footing, they're all just human beings, which is nice, beautiful. Okay, and yeah. can we offer you a drink? Is alcohol okay? Yes, we've got okay, yeah. whiskey, we've got vodka, we've got. I love whiskey. Okay, yeah. it's whiskey keto. Yes, because yeah, I'm on keto, so whiskey rum. I did uh, not know there was keto liquor. Yeah. I just thought liquor was verboten on all diets. <laughs> no, which is why I've been able to stick on keto because there ah, is keto. Ah, okay, liquor. gamba, please. And this is our whiskey bringer gamba. I feel like I feel like I'm in an onsen again. Yes, yes. So no, I got that. Okay, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, gamba. Thanks. Chin Cheers. chin. You were recently adopted by a cat. Yes. Yes. Which I I consider my influence. As in, I sent out these vibes. Not cats. Yeah. Go near Pepe. I said, where did it happen? Uh, Bonnie MRT station. Like walking mm-hmm. up the Bonnie Bonnie MRT steps. And I saw this small, like a really, really small kitten, like 
like this small, mm -hmm. hiding underneath the banister of the MRT oh, station. Oh, yeah. And she was shaking. And then when we um, bent down to, to look at her, she came closer. Mm. She walked. She, so we took her in. And then um, when we crossed the station to the other side of EDSA, we put her down because she was getting a little bit anxious, you know, yeah. antsy. But we put her down and then she went back closer to us again. She like slinked beneath our uh, legs. She's like, I have found suckers. Yeah. These guys are going to bring me home. Yes. Yeah, they're going to bring me home. They're going to feed me. They're going to give me things. And it came true. And it did come <laughs> true. No, but the, see, Royd pala saw her, this same kitten, mm -hmm. the mor that same morning. And she was really like looking around for a home. Her name is Petals. Yeah, around June, she started to be in heat. Is yeah, I remember first? you sent me a video on what is wrong with this cat because the cat was yowling. Yeah, yeah. And then when you touch the butt of the cat, like she'd offer her <laughs> Yeah, it's, her butt it's, it's, it's something like dogs hump people, but the cats will offer you their back view. So cats are bottoms, basically. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then. So, yeah. Um, so she was in heat for the very first time after six months. Uh, and then she ran out. She ran away. We then we, she she was away for one week. Uh, we and we live on like the forty second floor of a building. Okay. Uh, after a week, because we posted on you know the Facebook groups of our building, and yeah. then somebody had posted to say that we is this your cat with a picture of this like dirty um, cat wandering wandering the lobby, and it was her. Oh. So Royd found her, picked her up, brought her back. And a month later, we found out she's pregnant. Ah, so she um, left home for a bit to attend orgies and things. She left home for dick. Yes, okay. <laughs> Which uh, we can all relate to in yeah. some way. Yeah. And so she leaves home for dick, she comes home, and then a month later, poof, you now yeah. have kittens. Are you for, going to keep them all? Uh, I think Royd wants to keep them all. <laughs> Great, but so I, from I, zero cats, you're going to have five to cats. five. But that's going to be a problem. I almost killed a kitten last night. What happened? Because they, they're now walking all around the house. Eh? So I was uh, going inside the bathroom and then I closed the door behind me. And when I closed the door, I heard a meow. Kawawa. naman. But no, you just learn to, you know, shuffle. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I have to, I have to or know, drag you, my Or you feet. attach bells to them, so. Actually, that's what it's for. It's just that you will hear a constant ringing, but then at least you'll know when they're around. I have done my, my bit for the cat world. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so if you hadn't become a filmmaker, what do you think you'd be doing now? Because, you know, you're, you're from a well-known political family. People would Not think that, oh, he would go into politics. I, I don't know. I started making films very early, first year high school. Mm -hmm. And from first year high school, I already said that this is what I wanted to do. Okay. I, I really don't know. Like, I, Because I remember yeah. the first time I heard your name, you were writing for a newspaper. Yes, but also at the same time wanting to be a filmmaker because I was writing about films. There was some kind of, and this was early social media, there was some kind of flap over something you'd written. Really? That, that people reacted to yeah. in their usual hysterical way, which is how you know you've arrived. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. yes. But I wrote a lot of stupid things before. Well, now we're no longer in... Newspapers. Yeah, Do you what miss are newspapers? newspapers? Uh, yeah, what are newspapers? I don't They're know. like artifacts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They belong in museums. No, just kidding. Um, do you miss newspapers? Well, even if I did, there would be no point because they're True. dying and you know. I, I miss the feeling of being in an office surrounded by people who are like like minded and everybody yeah. coming together to put to close an issue. That was that yes. was nice and magical. I'm I'm happy that I caught that. Although, you know, that, that's also quite stressful. You know, it's very intense as deadline approaches. Everyone is tense and, you know, yeah. somehow the paper has to be put to bed. Yeah, and we actually got, our, our team got kicked out of a newspaper because we would finish so late. Okay. But then, you know, Again, and, and that's names. why you know that um, newspapers cannot compete with, with online because online, as in, I can post it now and have it up in... In, 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 in a minute, and with newspapers, everything has to go through a process. Yeah. You know, they have to cook it. Yeah, they have yeah. to cook it. Which, and, and that's the reason why they should stay alive. Pero they shouldn't be selling a physical paper. I think that's not what they're selling. That's they're selling true. information, verified. Yeah, because what, um, what the social media lacks is the editor, the fact checker, the people who yeah. will make sure that everything that goes out is 
is is is authentic. It's also the curation. Yeah, what's important? Yeah, what's important or what's nice that you should discover. On social media, we tend to get fed things that we already like and know yes. of our right. world doesn't become bigger it becomes smaller yeah and so uh it, it becomes important now to have a source of information that curates things that made yes. out of yeah out of your world it also shows you the different um perspectives yeah because um well social media is an echo chamber so you'll only hear things that you agree with and also um you need to support um the real news organizations that bother to assign experts and cover yeah. everything. Although the thing about curation, I think we we definitely should go back to that because even now Netflix is going to launch, I think, a feature where you get curated movies. So it's not just about the algorithm of what you like. These are like, you know, actual human beings putting together a list of mm -hmm. recommendations. We have to go back to that, I think. I remember you're um, mentioning that you got interested in filmmaking because you saw the, the behind the scenes of The Lord of the Rings. Yes. Yes. You, you watch the special features. When you saw all that difficulty, you said, yeah, that's what I want to do with my yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then, because um, we had to do uh, projects for Filipino class, mga Ibong Adarna, the movie, yes. Florante at Laura, the movie. And then I loved every single part of it, even the difficult stuff. Uh, writing, from writing the script to directing my classmates to like spending hours and hours uh, in UP film, because at the time we had to like capture our mini DV tapes. Yes. And then, um, you know, and then and then transfer it to the drive and stuff. I would be the one to close UP the UP Film Center mm -hmm. at like twelve midnight, one a.m. Okay. So I loved every aspect of the process, and that's how I discovered. Okay, I, I kind of like I like this. I love this. I want to do this. So you your your first movie was made under the auspices of Cinemalaya, and um, when 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 people hear what your first movie was about, they're like. Is he psychic? <laughs> because um, your first movie, Encuentro, is basically the whole Philippines now. <laughs> I said, how did how did you hear about this? Why did you decide to make a movie about that? I was a part of a project uh, with Rocket Philippines, and we were going to jails all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, and in this one, not even in jail, but in a drug rehab center, drug mm -hmm. rehab center in Davao, we uh, I, I met these two brothers. Their names were Richard and Raymond. This is their actual names. <laughs> okay. Uh, they were one year apart and they were being chased by the DDS. The, the yeah. early DDS. The early DDS, yes. not the... Yeah. And, and I was surprised because they were 17, 18, I was 19. And, and then meeting them and hearing about their lives, hearing them talk about how they were sure that as soon as they left the rehab center, they were, they, they were sure that they were going to get killed anyway or how uh -huh. the death squad had uh, barged into their homes looking for them, how their best friend had just been killed uh, days before they checked into the uh, rehab center. It just, it it knocked me out of my shell, yes, my bubble, mm -hmm. and I wanted to, to find out more about it. And it must be very disorienting um, a few years later that, so now the whole country is... Yeah, but not really, because when we were taking the film around, can't forget um, one uh, screening that we had, I think in CDO, where it was in this huge uh, mall cinema. Mm -hmm. And after the film played, a high school student raised his hand and said, um, Parang, I, I don't see what all the fuss is about. Those guys deserve to die. Okay, so, so you knew that it was... It, there, 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 it did strike the discussion. So I am really not... Surprised, Shocked. yeah. Yeah, so Encuentro, if I recall right, didn't really make waves at Cinemalaya, right? Well, people in, hated it. Yeah, as in, uh, I, I didn't hear a lot of buzz about it, and you know, um, it was not one of the talking points of Cinemalaya that year. But then you went to the Venice Film Festival, and then you won. Yeah, and, um, and a lot of people cannot survive early success, as in their life is downhill all the way. And you seem to be doing okay. No, I think my life has been downhill. <laughs> downhill yeah. all the way from there? No, no, seriously, how do you survive early success? It was hard, and I'm still trying to weather it. I don't mm -hmm. think I've survived, actually. Um, after that, there was literally two years that I couldn't even pick up a camera. Couldn't write, couldn't do anything. I spent my days at home 
gained a ton of weight, didn't care about myself. It was it's a lot... It's the classic sophomore slump. Yeah, also a lot of fear. Of course. Um, of uh, expectations. Um, yeah, pressure. Yeah. Pressure, but it's a lot of it is pressure that you place upon yourself. Of course. Literally. And, and um, could actually have been a bout of depression too, but it's so weird to say that you suffer depression after winning a prize. No, but um, it makes sense because you know you're coming off a high, and then your life will always will not always be that high. I, I wish honestly that that didn't happen to me, because it may have it, it is one of the best things, probably the one of career wise the best thing to happen to me. Yeah, because you're going to have it on your resume forever. Forever. Yeah. I always get to be called award-winning. Yes. Filmmaker. Whenever everybody, anybody introduces me, yes. somebody Although has I, to say that. I must say, I hate that um, adjective multi-awarded. Yeah. Whenever I see something begin with multi-awarded. Ah! It's like multivitamins, doesn't it? Yes. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it, it was also the worst thing. Uh, I think at the end of the day, I didn't even know who I was as a person. As you a were too young. I was too young. 21. Uh, wasn't even sure of the Please, path. I wasn't even a person when I was 21. <laughs> no, exactly. And it, I think it takes years to really get to know who you are or what your voice is as an artist. Imagine yeah, and writing... also it's, it's, it's like saying that oh, this is what he's going to do and you cannot change anymore. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like your, your tombstone has already been written. Yes. I didn't know myself and I think the last few years for me have been like a struggle to really find out who I am. As a person, as a filmmaker, what kind of stories I want to tell is the is the kind of story or the kind of film that I made in my first film. The kind of films I want to be making, really, is that really mm -hmm. me? Uh, is uh, or the second film or the third? Is that even me? So I made two other films after that. So the yes. second film went the other way. The third film went another way, and uh, and since then I haven't made a film. <laughs> yeah. And and the the problem is what you have become known for. You're you're not allowed to branch out as in basically that's what people expect of you so yeah there is a tendency i think mm -hmm. among uh, creative circles to put people in a box which i understand uh, which is great as a filmmaker if you found a box that you totally completely love and uh, that box speaks to who you are then by all means you should you know stay in that box and try to expand it but still you know wear that box like a badge for example, like I, I really look up to filmmakers like Lav Diaz um, as a creative because Lav has already figured out what kind of box he wants to be in and yes. he's happy to be in that box. Yes, and it's the box that um, if you leave and go out and have a coffee <laughs> and take a walk and when you come back, it's the same box. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's a whole like reasoning behind that. But, yes. but, but still, but I think it took him, in talking to him, I think it took him years yes, because to he discover was, that. He was... He was not young when he when he finally broke out with the whole slow cinema thing. Yeah, he wasn't. And he had tried many things before that. Yes. Many different careers. He was also a journalist. Yes. Um, and, and he had done commercial movies. He, he made the Mother Lily movie. In that case, he had a choice. And in your case, having one kind of removed the choice. It's not, that's what you have to do. You have to do that. Kind of, I think. Mm -hmm. Although that's complaining at this point. You made three feature films. And in the last few years, you haven't made a film. But you have made a lot of... Um, you, you've done a lot of advertising work. Selling my soul. Paying the bills. Paying Which the is bill. not, uh, not a thing to be underestimated. It's important, huh? True. It's, it's good practice. It is. Imagine every other week I'm shooting a different material with a different team. Yeah, different, different approaches. approaches. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's through that trial and error yeah. that I have become more comfortable in what I like and what I don't like, being able to admit to myself what it is that I uh, enjoy and what I don't. Mm -hmm. And then I think that informs the kind of work that you do. My, I would, if anybody would come up to me and ask for like st uh, advice on starting out, it would be that I wish I had started out um, in advertising or I wish I'd start, started out doing other work and then only started doing feature films when I really knew Okay. Who I am as a filmmaker. So would you say you are an optimist or a pessimist? You have to be. Because eh? yes. if you do dwell on the negatives, then... You're going to sit at home with the lights off and, you know, yeah. drink yourself to Stroking death. Stroking your cat, yes. that's basically. So you have to see it. You have to be optimistic when it comes to an outlook for the country. As, as a survival mechanism, be optimistic. Yeah, but uh, as, on, like, uh, as me, myself, I'm a pe pessimist in terms of everything I do. I always, whenever I'm involved in work, I always 
or even you know while traveling I always expect the worst that's who I am so it was a struggle actually to be an optimist so what makes you anxious yeah the news makes me anxious uh, whether I'm going to have food to eat in the next year makes me anxious um, whether my cats are going to be okay, am I going to step on a kitten tomorrow? <laughs> that makes me anxious. Yeah. Is my family be, going to be okay? Is my partner going to be okay? Everything. I am a very anxious person. That's what I'm trying to work so, on. So how do you deal with it? I asked for some help in terms of my anxiety. Okay. And then there was a, a while that I was taking some medication for it, but just a very small amount. But it, I didn't like the way it felt. Didn't really... Yeah, because it's, it's different for different users. Yes. Yeah. For me specifically, I couldn't function. It took away my sense of what I liked and what I didn't, which is so weird. Ah, you're in a, in a state of perpetual calm. Yeah, because usually when I don't like something, I can. it's like an itch I, yes. that I, I need to scratch. So imagine being behind a monitor, a pair of monitors, having to do work, directing, and I couldn't decide for myself whether I liked this shot or not. I was just like looking at it for five minutes and not knowing whether it was an okay shot for me. So that didn't really work for me. So I started um, doing other things like uh, Alternative therapies, therapies yes. and stuff. So having traveled with you on many occasions, I know that you are always checking your gadgets, especially when you were still working with the newspaper. As in, yeah, um, it's a long flight. While I am sleeping or reading a book, you are reading the news on your iPad, and then you're looking at one phone, and then you're looking at another phone, and then you have to check your social media. Basically, you're fidgeting all throughout the flight. But that's do you anxiety. still do that? Mm -hmm. I, I I try to minimize now. Mm -hmm. So, um, millennials are often referred to as snowflakes, kind of entitled, etc. And um, since I work only with millennials, I find that I have to defend your generation, generation. from my generation that's saying, yeah, millennials are horrible. So, is there any truth you think to this thing about millennials being entitled and uh, I don't know. fragile? I is don't it a know. generational thing? Because I, I know that Generation X also went through this. Like yeah, we were called generation. slackers. Yeah, exactly. The slacker mm -hmm. generation. I can say for sure is that, you know, we were the generation that saw the cross from analog to digital. Yes. And because we experience digital for the first time, we assume everything is going to be fast and quick. Yeah, but the telco sucks, so <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, but I think it, it permeates in our daily life when we, we mm -hmm. tend to look for immediate rewards. That's one thing. When social media first started, we were the ones who caught that mm -hmm. with Friendster and MySpace and Multiply yeah, I remember and all that. Friendster, yeah. I think because of that, our generation has felt a need to perform. So we're all so we're the blogging generation, the vlogging generation who yes. who lives for the likes, I think, mm -hmm. who um, would travel and and you know want to so stream you're, you're, every So you're constantly self-conscious because you're thinking uh, this thing that I put out will be seen by many people. Yeah, or will be commented on by people. Or yes. are people going to like this I will or be not? judged. Yeah. So I, I I I think that's another thing that we I can say about our generation that's not so good. My brothers who are younger, they are they're in high school. I don't think they have that because they don't have blogs. Uh, they have Instagram, but they don't really use it. They are more into messaging, like direct messaging. So it's becoming mo less about performing and blogging and more about um, messaging directly. To directly, yes. Yeah. But I will say your generation is a generation that elected Trump and Duterte. So, touche. Yeah, we have, um, we have a lot to answer for. Yeah, so I used to go to the movies three times a week. And now I find that I only go to the cinema infrequently, as in mostly when there's a Marvel movie opening. So so what, is the cinema dying? Or or have has Hollywood just given up on original projects and said, you know, if you have an original idea, go to a streaming service? Yeah, I think it's a lot of factors. Um, ticket prices are just so high. It costs, yeah. what, 300, 400 pesos to watch a movie yes. now. Plus, you have to factor in the traffic, the transportation, your Yeah, food. and of course, traffic eats everything. Because if you decide to watch a movie, that's the only thing you can do that day. So if you do the math, parang you're spending a thousand pesos if you're two. So I guess as a consumer, like if you're spending a thousand pesos, you want like the whole shebang. And also, they're just less and less willing to, uh, to, to gamble on mm -hmm. movies that they haven't heard of before, on movies without an artista. Yeah. Uh, or uh, that, that, that they're not... Um, familiar with. That's why sequels do so well because when I it's buy familiar. a ticket, it's familiar. Or, or yung mga rehashed or uh, like, uh, what do you call this? Rebooted movies from yes. the 80s and 90s. They do mm -hmm. well because when I buy the ticket, I know what I experience know what I'm, I'm gonna get. 
So it, it's that, and and the the economics of it has have forced uh, the event movies to to stay in cinemas and the more art house, uh, lesser known movies to find other venues. So because of economic factors. Um, you can't afford to go into the to go to the movies anymore to be surprised. You you have to know what you're getting even before you go in. Which is sad. I think other countries like with really good uh, cinema cultures like Paris, they've been able to uh, sorry France, they've been able to circumvent that by uh, pulling everything together. And like for example, if you if you live in Paris, you can mm -hmm. um, subscribe to this unlimited card. Mm -hmm. Now you pay maybe I don't know fifteen or not whatever. Uh, X number of euros a month, and that gets you to see. It's like a subscription. Like a subscription, but yeah. you can go to the movie house and, and watch any any amount of movies, uh, from art house to uh, to the more commercial fair. Yeah, and and it's good because it takes into consideration the fact that you know people these days don't have all that money to to spend on on watching movies. And so, do you think that the streaming services have taken over what used to be the movie turf? I think in many ways. Yes, it has helped. Uh, it's it's given a venue for many films to be seen by people, but it has democratized in many ways. I just wish that um, people would not forget the movie house experience because it's. I think there's no other way to see a movie. When I watch a movie uh, at home on TV, I'm always checking my phone, or it's, there's so many distractions, and of course the sound is not so good, the image is not so good compared to what you would get in a movie house. Yes, it's different in a movie house. Being in a cinema in a dark room, it's a it's a communal experience. Yeah, laughing Even at the same jokes. Even if the people next to you are narrating the movie to each other and getting the, the, the plot points wrong. Oh, I can't. If I have a noisy person beside me, I really... You leave or you talk no. to them? No. And they actually listen to you? No, because, first I... you know, for the most part, they'll just look at you and then continue talking. First I go, shh. And then if they don't get it, I go outside and I tell the guard. Mm, okay. But, you know, especially if they're senior citizens. No, there was one. I was watching a movie. This was, I remember, it was uh, uh, the Wes Anderson dog movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I Love Dogs. I Love Dogs, yeah. There was this elderly couple who was so noisy behind me for the entire movie. I literally went, I, 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 I stood up and I, I went beside them and I said, can you please keep quiet? And you know what they went, you know what they said? They said, heh! And then they spent the entire movie talking to each other. <laughs> okay. So see, old people also have like a fair amount of blame placed yes, on themselves. Yes, actually. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to set the example. Although I always remember my friend's story where he went to see Ocean's Eleven. And um, well, this is this this friend of mine, Ricky. He likes to pick fights in theaters with noisy people or people whose um, phone lights are too bright. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, he was watching one of the Ocean's Eleven movies, and um, a bunch of women near him. Every time Brad Pitt would come out, they would go he 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 he. As every time he 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 he. And finally, he he goes to them to to scold them, and it turns out to be a bunch of nuns. And then he's like, oh my god, this is the first time they've ever seen Brad Pitt in their lives. And they're probably thinking, if I knew that would exist, then I wouldn't have become a nun. <laughs> so. I have another story like that. This uh, one I did not tell them off. Mm. Uh, Love 3D was screened by the Q Cinema Film Festival years ago. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, Love 3D, this is a 3D movie with actual like uh, uh, ejaculation and yes, sex and yes. stuff. It's... There's one particular shot which is a close-up of a heart, uh, an erect penis. Uh, that's being stroked and then it ejaculates on yes. the screen and it's all in 3D. It's in 3D, yes. Okay. So, so this was, you can't miss it. Yeah, this was screened by Q Cinema and it was like a free screening or something, but I don't know why. It seems as if they had invited the Quezon City staff, okay. Quezon City Hall staff to that screening. Mm -hmm. So the, it was full of middle-aged people who all looked like the staff sa Quezon City Hall. Okay. Okay. And they probably went in the cinema Expecting love. Oh, it's 3D. a romantic melodrama. Yeah. Yeah, and then when people started having sex on screen, this ma two or three manangs behind us, the whole movie they were going, "Ay, just go, ano bayan? Ay, just go, ano bayan? Ay, just go, ano bayan?" <laughs> that happens. Yeah. yeah. I didn't stop them, nakasi Yes, but, but oh, the thing is, they did not walk out. They finished they the whole movie. They stuck around. Yeah. See? Yeah. If you were so offended, you can get up and leave. <laughs> yeah. Cinemas have been trying new things, like there was that Call Me By Your Name screening with a live orchestra. But that's not cinema-led, that was led by CC Concepts. Ah, uh, so uh, that, that's group. like an event that they did. Yeah, the cinemas have not, and I don't know why, they refuse to innovate. They feel like they have no problem, they don't have to fix their pricing, they're okay, they just have to keep doing whatever they're doing. 
but they should realize that they have to change and, and soon. You know, um, there years ago, the amusement tax was lowered from 30% to 10%. It should be zero actually, but lowered from 30% to 10%. And when that happened, I expected that the ticket prices would also go down yeah. to, you know, to just promote cinema going. Instead, they went up some more. Instead, they went up some more. And, and the cinemas are just pocketing more and more of that money. Yeah, and now there, there's this shtick in Ayala Cinemas. Yeah, Ayala Cinemas, where they make movies 4DX and they don't even have to be 4DX. I mean, everything is, your chair is moving and the door is opening, but it doesn't have to be 4DX. So. Yeah. But, it, of course, you know, they can charge more money for it, so. But yeah, and it goes back to like people just wanting an experience and you know, wanting to be titillated and stuff. Mm. Do you see yourself um, maybe in the future making a series rather than a feature? Hopefully, yeah. That's one of the things I plan hopefully to do. I think, you know, the movie house is, is a great experience, uh, but it's just one of the many ways that you can tell a story now. Mm -hmm. And um, people like to say that film is dying. I don't think so. Maybe the cinema going the experience. The cinema going experience is, is under siege, yes. Yeah. But filmmaking itself is not. It's thriving in streaming services, uh, in viral videos that you see online. And um, did you ever read reviews of your work? I used to. What is the worst review you ever read? I probably blocked it out. Uh, which is a good policy. I don't think people should read reviews of their work. Yeah. I think that we should have people we listen to and then they should tell us their honest opinion, but the rest just shut them out. Yeah, you're right. We should just have like a select group of people that we agree. And it's important to have people around you that don't just agree with everything that you do. People who can tell you, at, you know, like it is and uh, criticize you to your face. There are so many filmmakers I know and who their friends. Who would benefit from a little criticism. Yeah, honest. but who can't take honest criticism. Yeah, it's, it's something that has to be taught in film school. True. And having, but you know what, it's, it's an, I think, prevalent and present in other creative industries in of our course. country. Yeah. Even in literature, you have to Of course, agree. of course. Oh, and, and, and art criticism. What is even art criticism in the Philippines? When we talk about art, it's all about how much money was paid at auction rather than the art itself. And a lot, I think, of our art needs to be dissected mm -hmm. and read yeah. and judged, even judged on the basis of craftsmanship. <laughs> That's my TED talk. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so how, um, because I am required to ask people how they stay sane in these bonkers times, how, how do you stay sane? So one of the alternative uh, therapies that mm -hmm. I, I see, because they, they read you, and I've, I've seen two who are not connected at all, and they both sort of came out in my reading, you need to do something with your hands. Well, it didn't sound right. <laughs> but you need to find the hobby. Knitting. Knitting, no, exactly. Yeah. Knitting. But yeah, I need to do, that's my next uh, thing. I need to find something to do with some, my hands. Some handicraft thing. I, I'm really a, an, an, an untalented person. Because aside from film, I really do not... I, I really have no ability with my hands. Okay, there's a humble brag. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, aside from film. Yeah. <laughs> well, aside from ordering people around on a film set, I have no discernible talent. But you know, that is an ability because um, a lot of people can just issue orders and no one will follow them. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. So, what are you going to do after this? After this? After this recording, yeah. I have a meeting. Okay, for busy, a busy, <laughs> busy, busy. But you know, good practice and money's nice. Yeah, money's nice. Yes. Money's nice. Yes. So, <laughs> Why thanks very much. Whiskey? We we end on that note. Yeah, we like money. Yeah, we're <laughs> slaves to money. Selling your soul is nice, children. <laughs> <laughs> if you're safe, I need to, <laughs> to co-sign that.